It's F1 Nation, I'm Alex Jakes, he's Tom Clarkson. This week we check in with the master of Istanbul, Felipe Massa. But first, I know what you're here for. Let's get a Yuki Tsunoda update. And the good news for Yuki fans is that he completed 354 kilometers of the Imola circuit last week. No incident or accident, which means... He's looking good for a drive in 2021. Yeah, a lot of talk about a social media post that Yuki put up, which uh, showed some team kit and some people speculated more than one test's worth of team kit. No word about the lap times. Our understanding was that he was being assessed Has he passed with flying colours. I don't think we have long, TC, to wait to find out. No, we've got the Abu Dhabi young driver test, haven't we, in December as well that Yuki's going to be doing for the team. But I think it was a pretty inconclusive day in terms of lap time because it was wet to start with. I mean, he, he got to experience a Formula One car in all conditions, wet to start with. And then they put the uh, the hard compound tyre on and then they put the soft compound tyre on. So he, he experienced everything. He kept it on the black stuff and... I think did pretty much everything they expected. And and Franz Tost said as much after the test as well. So I think, AJ, now you know Yuki better than me. I think that seat is his to lose. Is that fair? I think that's probably a wise way of classifying it. Um, It seems extremely tough on uh, Alex Albon. But right now, I think it is his to lose. I think they are excited about putting him in the car And we'll see if he's done enough, I imagine, in the next few weeks. You might be familiar with his warm-up exercises before he gets in a car, having seen him a lot in Formula 2, but I hadn't seen it before. He does this dance. Have you seen it? (laughs) Yeah. What this is, and this is from years of working in the F2 paddock, where just before, maybe like an hour before the race, all the personal trainers... They come out of the motorhomes and they've got to justify being flown around the world with their drivers, haven't they? It's a nice lifestyle. They're a fan. They do a lot of very hard work. But you know what, TC? I've never been convinced with the warm-ups. They're all doing something. Some of them are boxing. Some of them are playing tennis. Some of them are doing the weird Yuki Sonoda does. Yeah, pelvic thrusting, I think, is what I saw. <laughs> good old Yuki. Anyway, good luck that's got to him. Do, that's got nothing to do with the warm-up. That's just, that's just what he does. <laughs> So it could be tough times for Alex Albon ahead. Uh, we, we're balancing the excitement of Yuki Tsunoda, uh, an exciting young prospect with the potential loss from Formula One of a really nice guy and someone who it's just not quite worked out for at the moment. And also Roman Grosjean shedding a little bit of light on, on that process. AJ, this was a, a really good insight. You're bang on there because he's revealed this week that... Only one driver on the grid sent him a WhatsApp when he was sacked by Haas a few weeks back. It wasn't Lewis Hamilton. It was George Russell, the new kid on the block, which is quite a a good insight. And he said that he thinks uh, George Russell is a really nice guy. And why wouldn't you if that's what he if that's what he did when you got the bad news from Gunter Steiner. And the fact that Roman is talking about this almost makes me feel that, yeah, maybe he's been ostracized from the group a little bit and is actually quite looking forward to a life beyond Formula One, which I'll see. So we like to deal with the big questions here on F1 Nation, and it is time once again for another mailbag. We'll do a full blown long section in a couple of weeks, but I want to get to a question from James because he asks the biggest question in Formula One right now. Why, TC, has Lewis Hamilton not signed up for F1 2021? Great question, James. And I think uh, the Formula One world is asking that question. And I think Toto Wolff is asking that question. They claim, the two of them, that it's because they haven't had time to sit down and do the negotiations, which last time they sat down to do it took about 10 hours. I think there's a chance that they might have had a go since Imola, actually, because... We've had a weekend off. That strange phenomenon in 2020 is we've had a weekend off and now is the time to do those sorts of discussions. I also think maybe Lewis wanted to get a few records under his belt because I think that increases his value because there's a little bit 
in the back of your mind that says, could Valtteri Bottas have won the world championship this year in a Mercedes? Difficult to argue for or against. I think it would have been close, but Lewis Hamilton can go to the negotiating table now saying, not only have I won this year's world championship, I've equaled Michael Schumacher's tally of seven and I have now won more races than any other driver in the history of Formula One. And that gives him a cachet that Mercedes will have to pay for. So I think it's all part of the negotiation. I think Lewis Hamilton is playing a game of poker with Toto Wolff. And I think it'll be fascinating. And I think it would be fascinating to be a fly on the wall of those 10 hour negotiations when it happens. They say they trust each other and that they're not talking to other drivers or another team. Fair enough. But I think the elephant in the room is the pay packet. And that's what the negotiation is all about. The thing I'm really interested to see is how many years Lewis signs for. Traditionally, Mercedes would like a three-year commitment. I think he would prefer a two-year commitment. I think he maybe wants to see what the new regulations are like, feeling of satisfaction. And you've got this great juxtaposition, haven't you, between Fernando Alonso's only coming back for the new rules and Lewis Hamilton might have done all of his winning. And when the new rules come along, he goes, you know what, fine, but not for me. I think it'll be a one plus two. So it'll be a three-year deal, but I'm sure there'll be a break clause at the end of 2021. So Lewis Hamilton can, if he wants, do eight and out if he wants to get on. He did say something quite interesting last weekend in Imola, which was, I am excited about the world outside of Formula One. He didn't phrase it quite like that. I can't remember the exact words he used, but that's what he, but that's what he was saying is that there is a life beyond that I'm excited about. And it was a reminder to the world and probably to Toto Wolf, I ain't going to be here forever. And it also put on all of the back pages, not Mercedes do it once again, but Hamilton considers quitting Formula One. Yeah. He's a good driver. He might be even better at PR. Do not check your phone or laptop for whether you are really listening to F1 Nation. We're going to get to a guest within 10 minutes of the podcast. And it's a very special one as well. V1 on the front, Felipe Massa wins the Turkish Grand Prix. And Massa, there is his proud father. What a roller coaster of emotions for them. Felipe, it's lovely to see you. Now, you're a man who's just got off an overnight flight, aren't you? Whereabouts in the world are you? Well, I'm in Sao Paulo in Brazil. So it's really nice to be here talking to you. And um, I, I was actually uh, a few days in Portugal. We have the World Championship of Karting there. And uh, I was there So as uh, the president of uh, CIK, FIA. So I was there and it was uh, really nice. I mean, it was a nice event. A lot of, uh, for sure, you know, the situation is quite tricky for the COVID. Uh, but uh, I think for the situation where we are, it was nice. It was a lot of drivers participating and uh, it was quite uh, a nice event. It was at Portimao, right? So we were there a couple of weeks ago with the F1 cars. Yeah. What's, actually, I remember um, Esteban Ocon telling me that the kart track at Portimao is really good. Yeah, well, maybe both, no? I think, you, <laughs> I think the race in Formula 1 was just amazing there, to be honest, you know? So I think the... The, the racing track, I mean, it was, it was, it was really nice. The in infrastructure they have there is amazing. But also the karting track is a pretty, pretty nice track. So we had them some good race. Unfortunately, it was raining a lot on Sunday. So, but uh, apart of that, everything was really good. No fights this weekend? No fights, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, let's talk Turkey, Felipe, uh, because if there's one track that I yeah. associate with one driver more than any other. I think it has to be Istanbul Park and you. And I'm thinking of the years 2-6, 2-7, 2-8. Pole, pole, win, win, win. I mean, tell me about it. How easy do you make it look? <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I always loved that track. So uh, the layout of the track, uh, I always, you know, get well there, competitive, uh, really enjoy the circuit, uh, but I mean, explaining why is quite difficult. You know, it's quite difficult to say why. I mean, I managed to win three times in the row there uh, with the three poles and uh, amazing races. So, so I think everything just uh, went together in the right way. So I was always competitive. I like this type of tracks, also the high speed corners, quick change of directions. For sure, you have like the 
the last sector is quite slow anyway, but you, you know, a part of that, you have really nice uh, uh, corners, you know, layout, and, uh, and I, I really enjoy, but I mean, definitely I had a good car, it was a good time, and we managed just to put together three times in a row. It was just amazing. Because the thing is, you didn't have bad teammates when you were no. winning in Istanbul. You had Michael Schumacher and Kimi Raikkonen. When you looked at your data compared to theirs, yeah. where were you quicker than them? Can you remember? Well, it's quite sure, a long time ago now, isn't it? For sure, it was uh, definitely competitive. You know, uh, even the, uh, especially I me. Mean, Kimi was competitive, but I think I was, you know, uh, further, you know, quicker than him on the, that uh, two race, 2007, 2008. Michael was a big fight. Michael, I mean, I remember he made he made a fantastic Q1 or Q2. And then I and then on the on the last uh, qualifying I really made a perfect lap and I, I started on pole position but I mean it was like a massive fight all the time and uh, in the race also we supposed to have a, a a massive fight in case it was no team order you know so we supposed to have a massive fight from the beginning to the end of the race uh, for because we we were really close in terms of pace. But, I mean, uh, the race was just for me because, you know, after a few laps, we had a safety car and, uh, and then we had to stop two cars in the row. And uh, Michael lost the position to Alonso. And then on that time, we didn't have like a DRS. So, you know, it was a lot more difficult to overtake. And uh, he couldn't pass uh, Fernando the whole race. And I was just opening the gap. But, I mean, if these things didn't happen, for sure, uh, the the fight would have been amazing for uh, for me and Michael, you know, uh, in case we didn't have any team order. <laughs> I remember you saying on the radio, almost apologising, Felipe, when you crossed the line and you won. I remember you said sorry for Michael, and and you just reached this milestone in your career. I th- a very unusual thing to hear. The thing that everyone's going to be talking about this weekend, turn eight. Is it as good as everyone says it is? Well, just going to the first one, to the first question. So uh, I said kind of uh, sorry for Michael, but uh, I was a little bit political, you know, because I, I was definitely not sorry, you know, for what's, happening. <laughs> <laughs> for, for what's happened on the safety car, you know, because uh, definitely it was the, the amazing opportunity I had to have my first victory. So, uh, you know, at the end, I was a little bit political, but uh, I was definitely more happy than, than, than anyone on that, uh, on that situation, you know. Uh, turn eight is definitely an amazing corner. I think it was really, really difficult on um, all my, my years in Formula One to do flat out. We managed to do maybe a couple of times, uh, like it, just if you have a, um, a new tires, but also the uh, wind that maybe helps also uh, uh, on that corner. Uh, now, um, I think it will be flat out easy. So to be honest, uh, I hope not. You know, but uh, if you see, if you see the, the the lap times the cars doing now, you know the amount of grip they have. So I think maybe they're gonna be flat out uh, uh, most of the laps, uh, especially with the reasonable good tires. So. Uh, but it will be definitely a massive G-force. So let's see how it's going to be. I think I hope it will be fun to, to watch and I hope it will be not so easy for the drivers. It's going to be fascinating to see whether it is flat. So we wanted to know, uh, Felipe, if you could do just one more race in your life in a Formula One car, would it be at Interlagos or would it be at Istanbul Park? Can we do two? <laughs> <laughs> Always pushing the limits, these drivers, AJ. <laughs> I know, I know. And I can understand why you'd, uh, why you'd want both. Um, obviously a track with uh, lots of uh, special memories. And uh, this weekend could be a, a serious moment in history for Lewis Hamilton. Um, he's a man that you pushed all of the way yeah. uh, back in 2008. Have you been surprised by his dominance since? Well, I think... Definitely, yes. I was never surprised for his speed. I was never surprised for the talent that he has because I think he showed all his career, you know, uh, his talent, you know, even when he was in the karting, even when he was, uh, uh, whatever, driving a little buggy on the, on the, on the, on, on the road, you know. So at the end, never surprised for, for his talent, but, uh, 
uh, to be honest, surprised for the numbers. I think yes, because I mean, if you see, I remember so well. I mean, when Michael was my teammate and he had uh, 91 victories. Don't even remember how many pole position was his record. And for me, it was like impossible another driver would, would be able to beat him. You know, so uh, for sure, impossible was not the right word, but I mean, it was close. You know, uh, that somebody can really beat uh, Michael's uh, record. You know. Uh, and Lewis will beat all of them, you know, so he, he already uh, beat, you know, all of uh, the records. So he's just, uh, he's just missing the, the victories in the championships, you know, to, to beat Michael. But I think he can do big and he deserves it. I mean, because of what he's showing in his career is just amazing. I mean, he has an amazing talent. He's quick. Uh, and to be honest, I remember also in the past that Lewis was also making some mistakes in the race. He was not using the tires in the right way. Now it's just unbelievable. I mean, he in the races that uh, Valtteri is on pole, you know, during the race, he's just uh, uh, put together a pace, uh, uh, you know, using the tires in a way that uh, is just amazing. I mean, he's doing everything in the perfect way. So he definitely deserves what he's having. Felipe, you were with Michael in his latter years at Ferrari and he'd been at the top for so long. And he said in the end, I'm just tired. Do you see any parallels, any similarities with where Lewis is at now? Because he still hasn't signed for next year. He's keeping us guessing. Do you think he's tired? Does it? How much does it take out of you to be at the front the whole time? Well, I think Lewis, he can't be tired now. You know, so he, he still have uh, some numbers, you know, in front of him to, to be like the... He is already, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, the best of the best. And uh, he can really be the best of the best, and everybody will will keep will say that for years and years, and for you know maybe decades or for whatever you know time in front of us. So I think uh, Lewis is just uh, uh, you know preparing his uh, uh, second two three years contract, you know, uh, which I think he deserves it to be honest, you know. So I think what he's doing it shows that. Uh, that he, de- he definitely deserved it to be, you know, different than all of the other drivers, you know, in terms of everything, even in terms of salary, you know. And uh, I remember also when Michael was my teammate, he was like that. I mean, Michael was completely different than anybody in terms of uh, everything, in terms of uh, records, in terms of numbers, in, and in terms of salary compared to everybody. For sure, Michael also helped many other drivers, you know, to increase the salary, you know. Uh, so that... That's what, in my view, Lewis is trying to do. And I, I think he's doing right and he deserves it, you know, uh, because he can do. He can show and he's, he's showing that, uh, you know, whatever things happen, I mean, he's uh, different than the others, you know, for the moment. And there's one other guy we wanted to ask you about, and that is Stefano Domenicali, your old boss at Ferrari, now getting the top job in Formula One. Were you surprised when you heard that he'd got that? To be honest, I mean, I knew even before he really, you know, uh, announced uh, because uh, I went to to Lamborghini, you know, to make like a, to put uh, your order in. Yeah, no, no, no. no, no actually, <laughs> I, I went there because he invited me to do like a kind of a TV series program, you know. And then I, I was like uh, two days with with Stefano in, in Lamborghini, and we also had a fantastic dinner together. And uh, and he told me. He told me that uh, he had that offer and he's just uh, thinking about it. And he, well, he even told me that he was like a few people, uh, maybe not not more than the four or five people that knew it, you know. Uh, so in, including maybe his uh, lawyers or, you know. <laughs> so at, at the end, <laughs> at the end, uh, I told him, man, I mean, I'm so happy for you. And uh, for sure, I mean, he... You, he had already amazing job, you know, with Lamborghini and what he's doing for Lamborghini is just amazing, you know, a job, uh, how much they are growing, you know, uh, how much uh, change, you know, as actually the Lamborghini with the times. And uh, I told him, you need to use, uh, uh, well, you need to do what your heart is telling you to do. And, you know, I'm so happy for you. And uh, I'm sure he will be uh, really important for, for the future of Formula One. I'm sure he will work day and night for that because he's a big worker. And he's a fantastic person, uh, and uh, he understands the business. He under, he understands this world that we you know we are living, which is Formula One, but also in the business side. After so many years that 
he's doing, you know, in Lamborghini and also in different things. So I think definitely he can be very uh, successful and very important for the future of Formula One as well. So I'm so happy for him because, I mean, he's like a brother for me, you know. As you say, he's a fantastic guy. What's, what's his greatest quality? To be honest, I think he's very humble and he has a very good connection with the people, um, uh, relationship with the people. And he works really, really hard. I mean, he definitely, uh, you know, he, he, if you want something, I mean, he really works really hard for that. And uh, so I think, you know, this is the important characteristic, you know, for for the new job that he's going to have, you know. So, and also he knows everybody. Everybody likes him. Everybody knows him. Even people that are uh, teams that, you know, in Formula 1, you have a lot of uh, fights, uh uh, between the, the team bosses, you know, uh, you know, you know, even some other people are, are around. And I think I never heard about a guy that really doesn't like Stefan or, you know, I think maybe he can be good for this connection between the teams, you know, rules and so many things that is definitely important to, to change in Formula 1. And we already see some change after the, the COVID. Let's see how it will be this change. But uh, I think he, he can be really important on that. Well, Felipe, it's great to get your thoughts on so many different things. And you are Mr. Turkish Grand Prix, as far as we're concerned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to be there in the race as well, but unfortunately with all of this uh, COVID, so I had to, to cancel, but I'm supposed to be there because uh, I was invited to be there in, in, in this race, but uh, unfortunately I couldn't go. But uh, I'm so happy you know, that they are back in Turkey and I will be watching the television maybe uh, since the first lap in the FP1. I always think it's so interesting to hear from Felipe Massa, not because he's just a lovely bloke, because he's gone up against Michael Schumacher, Lewis Hamilton, Kimi Raikkonen and Fernando Alonso, and three of them have been his teammates. And I think it puts Felipe Massa's Formula One career in an even better light as a result. Couldn't put it better myself, AJ. Also, I thought it was interesting when he was chatting to us then, that when we were talking about his three wins in Turkey. And he was, he slightly dismissed Kimi Raikkonen as a teammate. Yeah, yeah, I was quicker yeah. than Kimi, but it was a really good battle with Michael, you know. <laughs> really, yeah. But yes, he, he's gone up against the best. He hasn't shied away from anyone. And and I, will, I still get goosebumps thinking about 2008 Brazilian Grand Prix, where Hamilton won the first of what is going to be seven world titles and counting. And... Massa had it for half a lap and the way he behaved after that race was quite incredible. So magnanimous in defeat and um, he made a lot of friends. And I think he's an incredibly loyal person. Again, that came through in what he said about Stefano Domenicali as well. I just think he's a really solid guy and it's great to have him on the show. I think you're right about the Stefano Domenicali thing. That's a huge moment in Stefano's life. And he trusts that information to Felipe Massa before a wider world are aware of it. And I think it shows you Felipe's comments about Stefano give you a reason why he's got the job. And the fact that Stefano trusted Felipe with that news tells you a lot about Felipe Massa. He had a lot of thoughts about the Turkish Grand Prix, but I want to hear your memories, TC. When I say Istanbul Park, what is the first thing that springs to mind? Istanbul Otodrom. Because that's because <laughs> that's what it was being called when it was if if you like it that's what its working title was the Istanbul Autodrome and I all thought that was a fantastic name for the racetrack anyway it's now Istanbul Park obviously um, I've got good and bad memories what good. are we going to get first <laughs> well let's start with a good wonderful racetrack seriously properly good racetrack one of Herman Tilke's best right up there with Sepang it's got variety it's fast it's wide you can overtake. All of the above. Bad memories. 2005, first Grand Prix, won by Kimi Raikkonen. I got such bad food poisoning, AJ. Oh, no. (laughs) I got such bad food poisoning that I missed pretty much the whole race. And I can picture it now. It was the Thursday evening. I was at a Bridgestone dinner. And I looked at this prawn on my plate and thought... Prawns are not meant to be black, but I ate it I anyway. Mean, the, the, I ate it the anyway. Signs, the <laughs> signs were there. They were there and I ignored them. And I, do you know what? I was knocked sideways for the whole weekend. So that was 2005. 
The F1 Nation top tip about Turkish cuisine, say no to prawns. Okay, so that's that's life at the track, right? I've had a bit of food poisoning. Oh, bad traffic as well. Really bad traffic because uh, crossing the Bosphorus, um, the track is on the east side of the Bosphorus, on the, if you like, the Asian side. Most people, I don't know if it'll be different this year with, with all the COVID thing, but most people back in the day used to stay on the other side of the Bosphorus. So getting across it was long let's put it that way uh, long and you needed a lot of patience so it's traffic food poisoning there must be a third thing i can think of aj it's uh it's the istanbul tourist board tc <laughs> they want to <laughs> offer you a job chief marketing <laughs> officer <laughs> when you get to the racetrack it's a brilliant racetrack and and in 2010 it led to one i think one of the very best grand prix we've ever seen i think it's right up there in the best races we've ever seen the rebels inexplicably do this door wide open oh yeah they come oh, together no. weber and vettel have come together that's vettel going out weber going out and then a brilliant battle between mclaren teammates and you're thinking it can't happen again can it and the aftermath of that race lewis won but looked like he hadn't. Oh, AJ. I mean, in fact, there's been a lot of good races at Istanbul Park, but that has to be the best. And yeah, Lewis, I, I always thought Lewis after that race was a bit like James Hunt after the Japanese Grand Prix in 1976. Have I won it? Have I won it? And the reason Lewis was a little bit grumpy was because of this. And uh, Lewis, we need you to save fuel. We need you to save some fuel now. Both cars do the same. Understood, Lewis. If I back off, he's definitely going to pass me or not. No, Lewis, no. What the hell is going on? Just keep going as you are, Lewis, and maintain pace. All's well that ends well at McLaren, and that, yes, Lewis was a bit unhappy about the fuel saving. Martin Whitmarsh, who was running the team at the time, said it led to some very uneasy moments on the pit wall. But really... The only topic for discussion after the race was that Red Bull collision. Now, while you were watching that race on the TV, AJ, whose fault was it in your eyes, Sebastian Vettel or Mark Webber? Yeah, I thought at the time it was Sebastian Vettel's fault. What, moved a little bit to the right? Yeah, he expects Mark to move and Mark holds the line, which he was entirely entitled to do. And he expected Mark to blend back to the racing line. He didn't. Uh, But if you're the one moving then you're the one causing the accident. Interestingly, after that race, Helmut Marco apportioned blame at Mark Webber's door, saying that Vettel was two metres ahead and had the advantage and that Mark should have uh, moved to the right. So as you, can, I can't imagine what that debrief was like after that race, man. I would pay good money to hear it. And it never really recovered. That's what's interesting is that their relationship, it was the first time that their relationship, it, it had blown up on track between Vettel and Weber, and it never really recovered. And then it bubbled away for the next couple of years. And then it flared up again in Malaysia 2013 with Multi 21. And and irony of ironies is that they actually get on really well now. But it was just such an intense relationship because really, a bit like now, in those days, Red Bull was the car to be in. If you were in a Red Bull, yeah. you were going to win the world championship. And it was sort of Rosberg Hamilton esque, wasn't it? In terms of where that Mercedes were in 2016. And that's what we're missing out on, quite frankly, now with Mercedes is that we don't have that needle between their drivers, which at least gives us fresh narrative at every race. Well, I tell you what, if it's half as good as 2010 this weekend, it's going to be very, very special. And it's been the it's been the case for the last few Grand Prix anyway. We're either getting a thrilling race or we're getting some history. Well, that's all we've got time for this week on F1 Nation. We really appreciate your questions to the mailbag. We'll do a longer segment next week if you're not a subscriber. Oh, it would mean so much to TC, to me, if you hit that button. And if you are a subscriber, why not leave us a review? We will read the best out in the next few weeks or when I remember at the end of Abu Dhabi. Either way, we really appreciate your company. That's F1 Nation for this week. We will speak to you next. Next.